just always begin these things by saying the, uh, the GWF doesn't receive uh, federal funding um, and we don't take uh, a dime of your student fees money, unlike, um, I don't know, the football team. Uh, so uh, so uh, it's completely done on, uh, on private donations. And so I always need to begin um, by thanking the people who made it, uh, who made it possible. Tonight, it's uh, donations of uh, OU alumni uh, and by a grant from, uh, from the Charles Koch Foundation. So I, I need to begin by thanking them for that. So uh, truth in advertising, when I originally invited uh, Kevin to OU, um, I didn't think he'd be here to answer the question, uh, what is college for? Um, some of you may know him uh, from his short time in the Atlantic, uh, which he uh, covers in a, in a phenomenal uh, little piece called when the, when the Twitter Mob Came For Me. And that seemed to me like one potential avenue for uh, a talk. Alternately, I thought he might talk about uh, the Trump phenomenon, something which he's written searchingly and scathingly about in National Review articles. And in them, he's reported from and written about communities like many surrounding ours here in Southeast Ohio. And those stories have arresting lines like, um, the truth is about these dysfunctional downscale communities is that they deserve to die. Um, economically, they're negative. Um, the truth is uh, that they are negative assets. Um, morally, they're indefensible. Forget all your cheap theatrical Bruce Springsteen um, bullshit. What's needed is a U-Haul. Um, and it's arresting stuff, uh, and it's the sort of arresting stuff that's designed to set off both liberals and conservatives of a certain stripe, folks like Rod Dreher, uh and the French port, front porch Republicans. And it seemed to me the sort of stuff to be good to discuss on college campuses. Um, but that's not what he wants to talk about, and, and I think on, on reflection, that's a really good thing. Um, Are you sure you found it? No, 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 because, uh, because I actually, um, as, as, as somebody sitting right next to you know, I like to read what our university, how it actually sells itself. Um, right across the street uh, from here, there's, uh, there's something from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Uh, and it reads, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary for good government and the happiness of mankind schools and the means of education shall be forever con uh, encouraged. Our current mission statement, in case you wondered, is um, that uh, OU holds as its central purpose the intellectual and personal development of its students. And what, uh, what does the university profess to strive for? The nation's best transformative learning community. So something's changed between 1787 and 2018. Um, and you need someone who can speak honestly uh, and forthrightly to help figure out what that is. Uh, and that, I think, is what uh, Kevin Williamson will help us do uh, here tonight. Kevin is uh, National Review's roving correspondent and director of the William F. Buckley Jr. Fellowship Program in Political Journalism. He's been the theater critic for uh, the new Criterion. He went to the University of Texas, Austin, and he began his career in the Bombay-based India Express Music Company and spent 15, um, newspaper. Uh, newspaper company, sorry, not music, uh, and spent 15 years in the newspaper business in Texas, Pennsylvania, and Colorado. He served as editor-of-chief uh, for three newspapers uh, and was editor of Philadelphia's The Bulletin, and he worked at The Atlantic. He's also a regular commenter on Fox News, CNBC, MSNBC, and NPR. I'm delighted he's come all the way from Texas uh, here to speak with us, and I hope you'll join with me in welcoming him to Ohio University. Three days uh, tenure in a job usually looks uh, sort of bad. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight on a uh, rainy and ugly night here in sunny Ohio. Um, before we get started, a quick uh, survey. Just want to know kind of who's here. So, how many of you are here because you know me from the Atlantic business and you know I once wrote something about abortion that was controversial and uh, yada yada and that stuff? Any show of hands? Not one person? How many of you are here because you're National Review subscribers and you read everything I write? Okay. Are the rest of you getting extra credit or something? or uh, Extra credit? <laughs> okay. Good call. Good call. All right. Um, then I'm mystified uh, by why the rest of you are here. But I'm also so often sort of uh, mystified by why I'm invited to speak on college campuses. I get to talk on a lot of them. I rarely get invited back. So uh, that, that might tell you uh, something. I was just thinking the good thing about the Atlantic episode, which I guess I'll talk about maybe a little bit later, 
is that before that, the first line in my obituary was going to be that I took a cell phone away from a woman in a theater in New York once and threw it out the door. And uh, she was kind of rude. And uh, she was rude, I think. And uh, it happened to be that night was a critic's night. So like every newspaper in the English speaking world had this piece about theater critic loses his mind and attacks woman in theater. So now getting fired from a job after three days is will be the first line in my obituary if I should die tonight. Uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. Anyway, my name's Kevin Williamson, and uh, again, thank you all for coming out. There's a story about uh, Oscar Wilde, and he went to dinner one night with James Whistler, the uh, famous painter, Whistler's mother, you know this uh, painting. And they were at a dinner party, and Whistler apparently was a very funny guy, and very witty guy, and he said something that was uh, really clever at some point in the conversation, and Oscar Wilde, of course, didn't like being upstaged on that sort of thing, and Oscar said, uh, you know, I really wish I'd said that. And Worcester told him, well, don't worry, Oscar, you will. And um, I often have that thought about when I read uh, things that other people have written that I wish that I'd written or things that other people have said that I wish that I said. And one of those when it comes to politics comes from Chris Rock, of all people, who's a pretty funny guy, not normally very smart about politics, I don't think. But one of the great moments in American uh, political commentary, some of you may have seen this, he was interviewing Jesse Jackson. Have you all ever seen his interview of Jesse Jackson? So he sits down with the Reverend Jackson, and his first question is, so Reverend Jackson, what exactly is it you do? And uh, you would have thought a bomb had gone off in the room. It was just uh, quiet. And often when I'm on university campuses, I find myself asking that question of many, many people who are employed at these places. What is it you do? Uh, we kind of know what professors do, some of them anyway. Uh, we sort of know what students do, some of them anyway. But most of the people who work at universities I often wonder about, and that's going to be part of my uh, discussion tonight. So when you call your parents tomorrow and tell them you're dropping out of college, you can tell them that the uh, liberator came to set you free, if not your body and your bank account, then at least your minds from the university, which is a bloated, feckless, corrupt, worthless, and largely dishonest and parasitical institution. And I don't mean this particular university, although I'm sure it's a lot like other universities. I mean the university in general. It is this magical thing that has somehow convinced generations of otherwise mentally normal, intelligent young people that it's a magic portal through which you must walk if you want to have a happy life, if you want to have a good job, uh, intellectual fulfillment, culture, uh, economic prosperity, social standing, all that kind of stuff. This is simply not true. Uh, it's a scam. And that's what I'm here to talk about. But I'd like to start first uh, with a story about a guy who's very interesting to me. I wish I'd met him, but I never got a chance to. He was my wife's grandfather. In fact, he was a writer uh, back in the 1960s, 1970s. He was also a physician and an educator. And he had a really interesting life, interesting career. Uh, he was uh, dean of medicine at an important medical school. And he spent the last part of his life traveling around with the uh, Aga Khan building hospitals in the Middle East and Africa. Anyone know who the Aga Khan is? Yeah, see, this is what I mean about universities. Uh, he's the uh, spiritual head of one of the major schools of uh, Islam. And uh, anyway, so he went to uh, Princeton. And like a lot of young men of his generation, he uh, left school in a hurry to go off to Europe to fight in World War II. And so he went and fought in the war came back, uh, became a doctor, became dean of medicine, wrote a bunch of books, uh, did a lot of interesting stuff. And when he got late in life, he's in his 70s, he decided to kind of retire. And he wanted to set up a little office at home, the way people do sometimes. And it occurred to him that he'd left college so quickly that he didn't have one of those nice framed copies of his diploma. So he calls up Princeton and says, hey, could you send me one? And they said, sure, no problem, we'd be happy to. And uh, a few days go by, and someone from Princeton calls him back, and they say, we're sorry. Uh, we can't actually send you a diploma because you didn't graduate. And he says, well, that didn't seem possible. You know, I went and did all my degree requirements, and I, you know, I went to medical school and all that stuff. They don't normally let you in without a degree. And they said, no, you didn't actually. So what had happened was uh, Princeton, like a lot of schools like that, when the war was going on, they were doing expedited graduation procedures for young men. It was men at the time. There wasn't any women at Princeton until the class of 1973 um, who joined the military. But this only applied to people who joined the U.S. military, and he didn't join the American Army because he was a British national. He joined the Canadian Army and then went into the uh, British Army after that. 
And just no one ever got around to telling him he didn't have a college degree. And it uh, didn't seem to bother him one bit in life. He went and did all the things that he was going to do. Life was a little bit less bureaucratic back then. Obviously, if you wanted to go to medical school now, no one's even going to have a conversation with you unless you can give them a you know, transcript and triplicate and copies of your diploma and all that kind of stuff. So he did kind of a fun thing. Uh, when he was 73 years old, he went back to college because he uh, didn't like not having finished his degree. He didn't like leaving things undone. And so he took classes from people he had taught <laughs> you know, as a professor at one point. And uh, so he eventually finished his BA. Uh, it took him 53 years to do it. So if some of you are feeling like slackers, don't feel like too much of a slacker. Uh, some people take more. Now fast forward through time to uh, his granddaughter's generation. She also went to Princeton, as it turns out. And um, she works in architecture and construction. I can't call her an architect because she doesn't have a license. So they throw people in jail for that sort of thing, apparently. But uh, that's what she does. Anyone want to guess what she majored in at Princeton? If you're going to become an architect in life, what do you study? You would think sociology, which is a bullshit pseudoscience with essentially no intellectual rigor to it at all. And she majored in that not in spite of the fact that it's a bullshit pseudoscience with no intellectual rigor, but because it is a bullshit pseudoscience with no intellectual rigor. Because Princeton's hard. And it's full of people who are really smart and competitive. And she figured that was her best way to get through school and make reasonably good grades and, uh, and get out with it. Because she understood something that a lot of you probably understand, and people of my generation certainly did. It doesn't really matter what you majored in in life, right? And it really doesn't matter what your grades look like that much. It matters that you have a degree. And it matters where you went to school to some extent, especially if you went to uh, a, a famous school like Princeton or Harvard or something like that. Or, you know, the University of Texas. Not really. And uh, so think about the way things changed in that relatively short period of time. Her grandfather's generation didn't matter that he didn't have a degree. It mattered tremendously that he was a well-educated person, um, that he knew certain things, that he had experience in the military doing medical things before he went to medical school, and that he went on and got an additional professional education, was able to become a doctor and do the rest of the things. For his granddaughter's generation, it doesn't matter if she was educated at all, which she wasn't, really. I mean, no sociology major gets a real education. We all know this. And uh, any sociology majors in the room? Good, we can talk about them. Um, what mattered was that she had a degree. And so if you want to go to architecture school later because you have to go to an accredited professional degree program uh, to get a license and all that stuff, they don't care what your degree's in, they just want you to have one. Which, when you think about it, is kind of dumb. Uh, you know, you could major in poetry or art history or any you know, these interesting good things. Uh, I was an English major myself, it's not that I sneer at literature or anything, um, but what she said he had nothing to do with what she ended up doing. And frankly, if I have her right, I'm not sure her architecture studies have much to do with what she does either. Um, but these things you must have because we developed into a weird kind of credentialist society that says you have to have X, Y, and Z pieces of paper attached to your name if you want to do things irrespective of the content of what you have done in life. And that to me uh, seems nuts. Um, so some people go to college because they want a job, right? Um, people convince you that you won't necessarily get a good job if you go to college, but if you don't, you certainly won't get a good job, right? I mean, that's what you're told from the time you're born. Uh, this is one of the things you have to do. Of course, it's not really true. Um, there are lots of people who do all sorts of good things in life without getting a college degree. Lots of people who go to college don't do anything in life. Most people who go to college don't do anything in life because most people don't do anything in life. Um, the average person is average. Um, but it's built up as this necessary thing, this thing that you must do. And there's tremendous pressure, I imagine, much more even on you than it was in my generation, to do this and jump through whatever hoops need to be jumped through and to get this degree. And there is a sense that it's job training, although I'm not really quite sure that's true, and I'll go into that later uh, a little bit, but no one ever talks about whether job training and a liberal education as traditionally understood, which is what colleges and universities are supposed to offer, not only are not the same thing, they might not even be compatible. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can learn to do uh, and be taught to do in terms of jobs, but let's face it, learning about poetry is not training for any job. It's not even training to be a poet. Um, it's just one of those things that's good to know about, and it's worthwhile, and uh, it's illuminating, it's a good field to study, and I think that uh, people should educate themselves in these things if they feel the desire to, 
But the idea of going to college for four years, or five years in my case, and uh, maybe longer for some of you, or 53 years in the case of my wife's grandfather, because that's how you become, well, a journalist in my case, or whatever else anyone's going to do in life, is just absurd. Uh, that's not how these things work. So a third story uh, related to college degrees, which I think illustrates this a little bit. I have an old friend named Scott. And uh, one of the nice things about growing up in a smallish town like I did is you tend to know the same people your whole life. So I've known this guy for 40 years, and uh, I'm only 46 years old. I guess I've known him a little more than 40 years. He's a smart guy. He's from a good family, um, not a family with a lot of money. His father was a preacher. And unfortunately for Scott, not one of these like Joel Osteen preachers who make a lot of money. He was like an old-fashioned preacher who had no money. And so Scott decides, I'm going to go to college because that's how you get a good job. Goes to Texas Tech University, which is in my hometown, Lubbock, Texas. And he decides to major in business, business administration, which is another kind of bullshit thing, I think. Like, what do you do? Like, study business administration from the time you're 18 and 22, and you get out, all right, we'll administer my business. I mean, it doesn't really work. Most people who study that don't really learn anything. But he figures, go into business, right? That's what I want to do. Make some money. Doesn't have any money, though, to go through school. And even Texas Tech's not very expensive, but it still costs money to go there. And he doesn't want to take out loans, so he works. And what Scotty was doing at the time was mowing grass. Um, he mowed people's lawns, and he was pretty good at it. And after a while, you know, he had several residential customers, and he added a couple of commercial customers, you know, an uh, apartment complex here, an office park over there. And soon he had so much of this work that he had to take on some employees and partners and things. And by the time he gets out of school and finishes his BA in business, um, he's got a pretty good business of his own going on. So he gets his degree, and he goes to, you know, the recruiting sessions and all that, and the best job offer he gets is $40,000 a year. This is 1996, so $40,000, not terrible. And, uh, but he's making $150,000 a year mowing grass at this point. So arguably, he should have been teaching these business classes and not uh, sitting in them. Now, what was the point of his investment? Um, he wasn't enriched through the humanities because... I don't think Texas Tech probably does much of that in general, but certainly not if you're an undergraduate major in business. He didn't come out knowing really anything about business because you don't learn anything about business in a business degree. It's like getting a degree in basketball. I mean, you can play or you can't. Um, but he did spend a lot of money and did keep a lot of people uh, paid. He's a smart guy, but he's not what you would call a, a hardcore intellectual. I haven't seen him in a while, but I don't think he sits around at night reading Cicero in Latin or making notes on Finnegan's Wake or anything like that. So I often wonder what the hell he was doing there, uh, what he thought he was doing there. And I, I might ask you the same question at some point. What are you doing here? Uh, my own time at the University of Texas, 90% wasted, I would say. I had maybe one or two good literature classes, one good philosophy class, a couple of useful linguistics classes, other than that, no point of having been there. 90% uh, of what I got out of my college education was working at my school newspaper, which is something you can do without going to college because there are newspapers in all sorts of places. Um, if you want to learn to do something, the easiest way to do it is to, to go and do it. And the newspaper is really pretty great. Uh, this is the 1990s again because I am an old dinosaur and things are a little different. Print was still kind of a thing back then. So the UT newspaper, because UT is a great big campus, was I think the sixth largest daily newspaper in Texas at that time, something like that. We're talking about this over dinner. Weirdly enough, I was 21, I think, when I was the managing editor there, and I had a, a two and a half million dollar editorial budget, 121 employees, uh, which I've not had since then. I've worked at <laughs> a number of places and and some big things, but um, that's really what I got out of college, not the fact that I can recite the Lord's Prayer in Old English. Uh, can you? Anyone know this? No language majors? They make you do Old English still? or Not required. What is required? I was looking at your English major requirements here. And I was well, it depends on what track you're taking. So um, for the literature and writing, you're required to take two American literature courses, two British literature courses, three um, like extra courses that you want to take, uh -huh. a literary theory course or a history of English language course, um, and then a Shakespeare requirement and your three introductory courses. Is there a Shakespeare requirement? Okay, well that's good news because I was looking at the requirements and it wasn't clear to me that there actually was a Shakespeare requirement. So I was going to make fun of you for not having one, but now I can't, so stop my speech. 
Uh, when I was at UT, it was uh, either a course in Shakespeare or Milton or Chaucer, uh, which of course any reasonable, respectable program would make you do all three. But um, that's, uh, that's not where things go anymore. Uh, those are your, uh, I was looking at the concentrations in the English major here. One of them had pop culture at the end of it, which I just automatically write off as being almost certainly worthless. But um, that's good to know about that. So some people come here for education. Some people come here for job training. Some people come here because they think it's a magical portal to get them somewhere. And uh, in terms of job training, since I'm here at the EW Scripps School of Journalism, I thought I would do a little experiment real quick. Um, is there a journalism major in the room? A few. Can I get a volunteer? Someone who wants to volunteer for something? Orange shirt. Okay, I'll get back to you in just a second then. Um, so for a long time I was a newspaper editor. That's what I did before I figured out a way to scam people and to pay me for having opinions I already had anyway. And uh, I spent about 15 to 20 years doing that. Hired a lot of people over the years, reporters, editors, photographers, things like that. I never hired anyone with a journalism degree, not once. Um, that wasn't really by design so much. Um, it just kind of worked out that way. And I'm a little bit skeptical uh, of journalism degrees. But I always had a job interview that started with one question, which I'll ask you now, uh, journalism major. And if you got the question right, you, you moved on. If you didn't, you got sent home. So in one or two sentences, define millage. Right. Most people haven't. Your parents know what it is. It's how your property taxes are calculated. It's kind of like a percentage, but it's a dollar in taxes for every thousand dollars in value or something like that. In Ohio, like most of the rest of the country, millage is something that people who own houses and go to school board meetings and cover city councils and things like that know. People who study journalism don't know this stuff. I get kids coming from the University of Pennsylvania because I was in uh, Philadelphia at the time, which is allegedly a really good journalism school, um, who just really didn't know anything about anything. Uh, they could tell you about you know, uh, issues in statistical analysis and reporting and things like that, but they'd never been to a school board meeting or knew how zoning worked or what taxes were or uh, any of that basic stuff. So I'm a little skeptical uh, from my own professional experience of the idea of the university as a place for job training. Um, I suppose that's probably the case with engineers and maybe some other people in technical professions where there are actually you know, specific sort of relevant things that you have to be taught to do your job. Uh, it's certainly the case for people in uh, things like computer programming and that kind of stuff. But most jobs aren't like that. And the idea that this is going to be a place that's either going to be a place that teaches you about the humanities and gives you this enriching liberal arts education, which most universities don't, or is going to be a place where you learn how to uh, do something for a profession once you get out of school. They don't really do that either, so what the hell are they doing? Um, which is a difficult question to answer because it's not always obvious. Um, I don't really know what a lot of universities are doing. The American land-grant university system uh, which this is a part of, was built, I think, with the best of intentions. The thing that is largely misunderstood, though, is that those intentions don't have anything to do with any of you. Um, because you pay this institution twelve or $25,000 a year, depending on what your state of residence is, you tend to think of yourselves as the customers, right? But you're not the customers, you're the product. Um, that is one of the things that people don't really understand. The American higher education system like the American public education system, is really based on an old Prussian model. Uh, Prussia being an old part of Germany way back when, and they had a very specific idea about education that was subordinate to the needs of the state. So the idea of the Prussian education model is that the state needs diplomats and administrators and bureaucrats and other people who serve the government. And the idea of higher education is to produce these people in order to be products that serve state. Uh, so you're basically trained to be a kind of widget. And the American model took that, and our early education founders here were uh, explicitly uh, trying to replicate the Prussian model here in the United States. If you go back and read Dewey and the rest of these crazy authoritarian guys, um, they were very much uh, on the German model, which is why we have like a German word for preschool, right? Why is it called kindergarten? Uh, because we borrowed it from, from, from that model. But the United States is a little bit different, of course, than Europe in the sense that our culture has never been as dominated by government as European cultures, particularly German-speaking cultures, have been. Uh, we are unusually responsive to business culture in the United States, and so that is reflected in the way our schools are organized, in the way our public schools are organized, also in the way our colleges are organized. So partly it's the old Prussian model of producing what the state needs, but also it's we have to train workers for the economy, right? Um, business needs people who can do certain kinds of things, and the idea of the universities and the public school system is that they're going to produce 
en masse on a factory education system, the workers that the uh, economy needs, the bureaucrats that the state needs, and of course us being a kind of liberal democracy also to train people in citizenship so that they can be responsible voters who can be entrusted with the franchise. And hell of a job we've been doing on that. Um, no, you don't think so? I don't either. So, uh, you have to understand the ideological basis of this, I think. You have to understand the philosophy behind where this stuff comes from. And it has nothing to do with the time we live in. It's really late 19th century, early 20th century, and maybe mid 19th century. Uh, does anyone know Frederick Winslow Taylor, that name? Uh, Taylorism was all the rage a while back. It's scientific management, as it's known. It's the idea of applying scientific principles to the management of business enterprises and factories and things like that. If you look at various ideological strains of what was going on in the late 19th, early 20th century, whether you're talking about Taylorism in the United States and uh, managed competition as the American robber barons believed in rather than free markets, Italian corporatism, Marxism, Anglo-American progressivism, they all have in common this idea that social institutions and organic social trends can be managed scientifically the way a, the way a factory is managed, the way a business enterprise is managed. And uh, in the United States, this has been a particularly poisonous uh, ideological misadventure because we do take so great account of business and business people that it's really easy to infect non-business institutions with this kind of thinking where it doesn't really belong. And we hear this in our politics all the time, right? We need someone who will run this government like a company. Really? So what, the Department of Education is going to turn a 6% profit? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? But these are things that we tell ourselves and things that we say that um, we don't really think about because they're part of ideologies that are really deeply embedded in our institutions. Things that we never really consciously think about, but they're there, they really shape how we do things. And it's all around if you look at it, particularly when you're in high school, elementary school, how are they organized, right? They're organized like factories. Uh, they're bells and cells, right? They move you from one station to the next station like an assembly line. You're gonna put a little history in your head here, a little English in your head here, and you're gonna go on down. It's gonna be eight hours, approximately six and a half to eight hours, about the same as the work day. And, um, you know, you may as well be making Model Ts, right, and bolting doors on. Um, they're either designed like factories, and that's usually in the sort of nicer, more suburban, well-off areas. Or if you're in poorer areas, particularly in cities, the architecture is that of prisons, where they are designed for, you know, ingress and egress control, surveillance, staff safety, all those kinds of things. Go visit a public school in New York City sometime. And if, have you ever been to jail? Not, even, not one of you has ever been arrested. Well, how'd you end up, oh, you were visiting someone? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if you've ever been inside a jail, um, particularly sort of like a low security uh, county jail, they're exactly like high schools. They're exactly like high schools. Uh, with metal detectors at the doors, they're like city high schools. Um, so don't be afraid to see what you see. If you look around, you can see the ideological basis of this stuff in there. So what's interesting and problematic about that, of course, is that um, we are training people for the economy based on a 19th century model of economic production that doesn't exist anymore. Um, you ever seen the Hudsucker proxy? Gosh, I'm old, okay. Um, once upon a time, if you went into a bank or an insurance company or something like that, there would be a big room full of clerks. There'd be 100 people at identical desks, all wearing white shirts, and uh, all men, of course, because that's how things worked at the time. And they were doing paperwork in this very orderly, organized, fashion. This is before computers, so you needed a million people to do this kind of paperwork. There's this great ballet of bureaucracy. And those kinds of regimented, systematic, uh, procedural approaches to business along with the assembly line and other things that we're used to were really what um, most deeply influenced not only the business thinking of the time, but also the political thinking of the time. The idea that society could be run the way a business is run, that society could be run the way a factory is run. And that is really the fundamental ideological assumption that shaped how we do education. And what's interesting about that is that uh, they're training you to be widgets, and nobody needs a widget anymore. Uh, do you have, any of you all follow Silicon Valley, not the television show, but the actual place and business? Um, they're full of these weird, banal business cliches, right? And one of the words they love is disruptor or disruptive. And uh, in fact, a couple years ago, I hosted a panel 
at the uh, Tribeca Film Festival, of all things. I don't know why they asked me to. And it was about disruptors in philanthropy, which it turns out you don't really disrupt philanthropy. It's still pretty much rich people giving poor people money the way it's always been. But uh, people love this word. And if you ask people, you know, in the Bay Area, people who work in these uh, high-tech technology startups, what they're looking for, you know, it's products that are disruptive and people with these, you know, outside-of-the-box ideas and all this kind of stuff. What's the one thing that will get you thrown out of a public school? Disruption. Uh, you can do anything you want in a school. You can believe anything you want. You can be any kind of person. If you disrupt a classroom, you're out. It's the one thing that everyone does. It's the one thing we talk about that we don't really want to uh, inculcate in people. What are the virtues that are taught in the schools? Showing up on time, being able to sit quietly for an hour, doing as you're told, uh, working in a cooperative way, attending committee meetings, which is what really lectures are when you go to a class. You go to a committee meeting, you get your assignment, you go back, you come back, you bring back your quarterly report in a timely fashion, uh, according to whatever uh, typeface and font and everything else that your business specifies. Um, we're teaching people how to work in 1950s corporations that don't exist anymore. And disruption is the one thing that will not be tolerated. And since we brought up the Atlantic thing, uh, that's really why I was fired there. It had nothing to do with my political views, uh, which are less radical than a number of people who published the Atlantic. I mean, Christopher Hitchens published there forever. The guy was, well, had some pretty strong views. Uh, it was a matter of class hygiene, really. I was a person who was disruptive to the institution, and the institution felt like it couldn't function with me there. And uh, that's the one thing that institutions like that can't really handle. College institutions are the same way. It's, uh, uh, how to put it? Not so much a question of what you believe or what your values are, but whether you're willing to say these things in public, whether you're willing to act on them, and how that fits into the larger pattern of the organization that you serve. And um, the scam part of it, of course, is that uh, these giant institutions have been built up, these giant financial interests that don't really have anything to do with you, with your interests, with what you really need in life. Colleges would look very different if they were trying to do one of the two things that they allegedly are here to do. They would look a lot different if they were here to provide a general humanities or scientific education, because there wouldn't be any journalism majors, for one thing. And uh, they would look very different if they were here for job training. They wouldn't be training you to be 1950s widgets in factories that don't exist anymore. They'd be training you to do different kinds of things. But these schools aren't really about you. Your interests are not what dominate these places. Um, if you want to know whose interests are reflected in an institution, look where the money comes from and look where the money goes to. Uh, something we'll get back to in a minute. One of the problems is we educate too many people. Um, we send way too many people to colleges and universities. And this has to do with an interesting problem that we have in our political discourse, which is that our political discourse, like all political discourses in all countries, are dominated by our political and economic and cultural elites. Uh, elites is a word that's come into disrepute for some reason. I don't use it in a pejorative sense, the way people talk about, oh, the elites behind the scenes. You know, that's nutty kind of talk. But the people who dominate our politics and our political discourse, people who went to college, typically people whose household income is more than $100,000 a year, typically people who have advanced degrees of some sort. And that discourse, of course, always reflects their interests. Not in a way that I'm talking about that's like subversive and they're plotting against people. It's just literally the way they see the world and what they're interested in is the thing that's on their mind. Which is why every time we have a conversation about, wow, there are really poor people in Appalachia, or there are really poor people in the South Bronx, what do we do about this? And their answer is always, well, law school, obviously. We need to get them to go to law school. Uh, you know, get more people to go to college, um, which is probably not the right answer for a lot of people. But when college is what worked out for you, and when your model of living worked out pretty well for yourself, it's natural to tie to uh, generalize from that to other people whose lives aren't very much like yours. By my estimate, something like about 5% of the population probably has the intellectual capacity and the inclination to benefit from a traditional liberal arts and humanities education. Another 5% probably has the capacity and uh, inclination to benefit from a similar uh, scientific and technical education. There's an even smaller number of people who could benefit from uh, advanced education in things like the arts and music and other creative things that require uh, some cultivation, skill, and instruction throughout life. Uh, but we are now sending, uh, you know, more than half of the people from your generation to universities and colleges uh, for no apparent reason. 
uh, with no real goal, uh, no real plan for it, and uh, of course saddling you with a great deal of debt and uh, all the rest of it. So again, I would like to uh, just remind you that the, the, the best way to understand this is that you're the product and not the customer. So I came here to talk about what is college for. And uh, maybe the best way to answer that is uh, who is college for? And again, I don't think it's for you. I don't really think it's for professors either. I mean, it's a good life being a professor. A lot of places, it's a good gig. But um, professors are like the, uh, they're like the kickers on NFL teams, right? When you bring them out when you need them and you want them to perform well, and a couple of them are, are stars, but for the most part, you know, you don't think about them too much. Um, so if you want to know who an institution is for, you know, it's the old Latin question, qui bono, to whom the good, who benefits. Have you all ever looked at the changes in university budgets over the last 30 years? So universities spend per student now about three times what they did 25 years ago. Uh, the budgets have gone way, way up. Almost 100% of that additional expense has been personnel costs. And almost all of those personnel costs have been for non-educational personnel, not for professors and instructors, but for university administrators of various kinds. And I really think that if you look very closely at the economics of the modern university, particularly the modern public university, your conclusion will be that what it actually is is a full employment program for intellectual mediocrities who otherwise couldn't get a job that paid more than $40,000 a year. It's a sort of supplementary welfare state for the educated middle class who don't have skills that are useful in a modern uh, market environment and don't have uh, the ambition to practice law and they're too lazy to sell real estate. Uh, the university is a great place for you to land if you're one of those people. I was going through some of your uh, administrators here on campus and I was been debating on whether I was going to use names on this or not. And uh, I think I'm not. Although this one I'm picking on because she uses doctor in her title and she's not a physician. And uh, people use doctor. Uh, just bothers me for some reason. There used to be a school superintendent for a place where I worked. His name was Jamie Savadoff. And his business card said, Dr. Jamie P. Savadoff, PhD. So it's doctor and a PhD. Got you coming and going. Uh, I never really understood that. So I was going through one of the uh, administrators here on campus. She is the director of a campus program. And uh, part of her job description here, what she does, says, uh, I'm available for meetings at my office, coffee, lunch, email conversations, phone conversations, and attending events. This woman has a PhD. Uh, Full-time employee, head of a department or head of an agency or program here at the university. And her job in life is to be nice to people and make them feel good, I suppose, and to talk to them about things. Now, I'm not saying that universities don't need counselors and things like that or people to go to or an ombudsman if you've got problems with your bureaucracy or things you don't know about, questions you need answered. There are a lot of perplexing things about modern university life, how financial aid works. I had no idea about that when I was in school, those sorts of things. Um, this particular college has dozens and dozens and dozens of people whose job descriptions I went through before giving this talk who, as far as I can tell, don't actually do anything. And I go back to the Chris Rock question. I would like to have some of them here maybe and just say, what is it you do exactly? Um, and so far, I don't think there's really a very good answer for that. Um, I won't go into this too much right now, but I also looked at some of their doctoral dissertations, and they are hilarious and illiterate. This one has two grammatical errors in the first paragraph. This is on her resume. Uh, have you all been following these uh, pranks with the academic journals? You know about this stuff? For those of you who don't, it's a group of people who have come to suspect that a lot of the intellectual and academic journals are not actually very serious and maybe not looking at their work that closely. And so they submitted these hilarious papers to them. Uh, one of them is Mein Kampf, but it's got some uh, academic buzzwords thrown in instead of the anti-Semitic stuff. Uh, another one was generated by something on the internet called the Teen Angst Poetry Generator. <laughs> Accepted by peer-reviewed journals and published. Yeah. And it would have kept going, except someone at the Wall Street Journal saw one that, uh, man, what was the title? It was something about uh, something queer performativity in the dog park experience. And it's about people getting nervous when they see dogs in dog parks of the same sex interacting in a sexual way. Completely made up, published in a prestigious academic journal. 
Um, so, so far, uh, six of those papers have been retracted as quote unquote fatally flawed or beyond repair. A <laughs> uh, few others um, have not. Uh, one of them was quote unquote a rambling poetic monologue of a bitter divorced feminist, uh, much of which was produced by a teenage poetry generator. Um, this is the sort of thing that makes me say this is a scam. Um, not that I want to come up here and tell you you're wasting your time. You should probably go ahead and finish your degrees unless you're a journalism major, in which case you should switch. But um, because we do live in a world in which a lot of enterprises, opportunities, jobs have been reorganized around having a degree. A lot of it I don't get. A lot of it's completely irrelevant. Um, some friends of mine were involved in a lawsuit in Texas, which didn't have to do with degrees. It had to do with professional licensure. And uh, there are women who do what is professionally known as African hair braiding. So uh, women of African ancestry apparently get their hair braided in a particular kind of way. And there are women around in places that have particularly large Caribbean populations and large African immigrant populations who specialize in this kind of hair braiding. And so Texas passed a law that required something like 200 hours of higher education before you could be an African hair braider, uh, which normally this is a job that's done by 15-year-old girls who learned how to do it and charge $4 an hour or something like that. Um, that eventually was thrown out on a legal challenge. But the world is really very much organized around these sorts of things. There are genuinely people in this world who think that you can't be a journalist without a journalism degree. Uh, there are people who think you can't be an artist without an art degree. Uh, you know, the MFA programs are full of people who think they're going to be novelists and screenwriters and things like that, whereas most novelists and screenwriters would never think about doing that sort of thing. So where does the money go and how does the money happen? Um, well, that's really the interesting thing and one of the things that your generation is getting screwed in in a particular way worse than mine did. My last semester's tuition at the University of Texas was $875 or something like that. Not very much money. Yours is, I take it, a little bit more. Um, I was lecturing at NYU a couple years ago, which at the time was the most expensive college in the United States, and I gave them much the same talk and asked them if they felt like they were being screwed, and they kind of, you know, felt like maybe they were. Um, people like to spend money on their political allies. Government likes to spend money on its political allies. This is a right-wing thing, left-wing thing, Republican thing, Democrat thing. Uh, all sides do it. But the hard thing about doing that is if you want to spend money on someone, you have to account for it. You have to put it in a budget. Theoretically, you're going to tax someone for it. And this is often unpopular because the people who pay the bills for this sort of thing um, don't like the way their money gets spent. This is why welfare reform is always the easiest thing, right? Because no one politically cares about poor people. And you spend money on them. People say, hey, I don't want to pay taxes for that. And uh, welfare reform is an easy thing to do. So we spent a lot, a lot, a lot of money on higher education. Uh, the spending on it really started to ramp up in the post-war era, the 1950s. 1960s to the 1980s, it just went through the roof. The uh, spending on administrators went really, really high. But people started to push back because they started looking at places like Ohio and Texas where the budgets for the public schools got pretty big. And they said, we really can't afford to spend any more money on this because people resent the taxes that we pay on it. And they came up with the greatest solution to this to all time, which is you. They use you as conduits to move the money through you in the form of loans to the university, to the full employment program for the otherwise marginally unemployable mediocrities, and you get to graduate with 40 or 50 or 60 or 75 or $100,000 in debt, uh, depending on where you went to school. It's simply a way to avoid accounting for the money they want to spend on these institutions. I think that's a pretty bad deal. I think it's a pretty bad deal for everybody. So what is the university for? The university is for transferring money from you to people who don't want to do other kinds of jobs and probably can't. Um, I think it's a cynical enterprise and I think it's one that actually does not achieve much of the actual business of education, which I think should be the two major kinds of education should be disentangled from one another. Uh, if you're here to get a job, then we should do vocational training and job programs and things that are actually useful for doing that. If you're here to get a humanities education or a science education, we should treat that as the thing that it is. Pretending like these are the same thing, or that they're somehow related um, or that the same institution makes sense to do both things, I think is a mistake. And I'll, I'll close with one other uh, sort of degree story because I think these things are just hilarious. Um, so like my uh, wife's grandfather, I actually left school before I'd done my degree. I was offered a job, as mentioned, at the uh, Indian Express newspaper group in Bombay, and I went there to go work. And uh, so I was you know, newspaper editor and writer and stuff for a long time. And eventually I got around to wanting to go finish up that degree because I also hate to leave things undone. And so I called up the University of Texas, these genius people at the University of Texas, and I said, what do I need to do to finish my degree? And I said, well, you basically got everything done. 
what we need you to do is to come in and complete the undergraduate writing seminar. And I said, I actually teach the undergraduate writing seminar at King's College in New York. Maybe I don't need to take the undergraduate writing seminar. They're like, no, you're going to take the undergraduate writing seminar. I said, I'm a published writer. I've got like, three or four books out. Can I have my agent send you a note that I can write? Or maybe Harper Collins or Bill Buckley or someone? No. Uh, you must come take the undergraduate writing seminar, which is taught by someone who, of course, has never published a piece of writing <laughs> for money uh, in his life. When I was a young kid, I was kind of a jerk, as I maybe still am in some ways. But I remember being sent to my high school guidance counselor to talk about what are you going to do for a living, that kind of stuff. And I refused to go. I said, I'm not going to talk with whatever his name was, Mr. Edwards. And eventually someone said, why? And I said, because I'm not taking career advice from someone who ended up as a high school guidance counselor. You know, it just doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Um, it doesn't seem like a very smart thing to do. Um, that was not received as a... Uh, is a good explanation for why I wouldn't do it, and I don't think that was uh, probably the best moment in my life. This by guy probably got crap like that from little assholes like me all of his life, and it must have been a probably a pretty terrible job in some ways, I think. But I think the principle actually is a sound principle. Um, we teach people uh, in journalism classes that are taught by people who've never worked as journalists. Uh, we teach people to watch television shows instead of reading novels. Uh, we have people who don't really know much about the things that they're doing. Teach classes that maybe have words in their title that sound like they're related to the thing that you're supposed to be doing, but they really aren't. Uh, we do a really very poor job of it, and I think that uh, what we've seen, particularly with the recent pranks on the academic journals, is that even the professors who used to take this sort of stuff seriously have stopped taking it seriously. So my question for you is, if they don't take it seriously, why should you? I'll take any questions you have. Are we doing uh, microphones or just stand up and ask? Would you mind standing though? Uh, I think she was first. Yeah. So you're talking about job training as yeah. well as the humanities. So um, college of education is an interesting mix of job training as well as the humanities because we're trying to teach those particular subjects. So you have to be pretty well educated in that subject. So then what is your idea on how you know, teaching someone to be an educator yeah. Yeah. for future generations, how would you approach that? Sure, I would start by, thank you. Um, I don't say this sort of stuff to be shocking, but honestly, I would start by closing down the colleges of education. They are uh, typically the worst part of any university. If you look at the average SAT scores and grades of people entering into a university, people going to the college of education are always at the bottom of the list. They are the least academically selective and rigorous programs in universities. Colleges of communication are usually second lowest on the list. Um, teaching is a little bit, I think, like journalism in the sense that it is not something that is like being an engineer or a lawyer where there's a particular body of knowledge that you have to master that makes you a teacher. Now, it's good to know things, obviously, about the subject you're teaching. If you don't know music, it's hard to be a music teacher. I think we would probably be better off in most cases if people would simply pursue a course of study in the field that they intend to teach and then do some teaching to figure out whether they can do it or not and maybe you know, working in a kind of apprentice relationship with someone who is a good teacher, because there are some things you can learn from people who are good at doing things, who have some experience doing it, but typically it's not a, you know, four-year program of abstract study. Do you mind, yes? You had a question, sir. You mentioned how, like, college is kind of a scam, and we shouldn't be here all four years to spend all this money. So what is kind of your solution to that? What would be your idea of higher education after high school, per se? One of the big problems that we have as a society is kind of that question, the idea that there is a solution to things. This country is 325 million people with an extraordinarily complex economy and extraordinarily complex society. The idea that there is a model of higher education that is going to work for a population like that is just nuts. Um, you know, Bernie Sanders uh, sneered about there being like 75 different kinds of deodorant, right? But um, there should probably be at least 75 different kinds of education, right? Because different people are trying to get different things out of it. So I think that the question we should do, that we should ask ourselves, rather than start with how do I design a system of education, is what is the thing that we're trying to accomplish? And who are we trying to accomplish it for? What are their actual interests in life? Um, which is something we almost never ask people your age, right? Um, people say, what do you want to do? Um, they might ask you in a very sort of vague kind of way, like, you know, I want to grow up to be a fireman, basically. I mean, the version of that that you ask people when they're 18 years old. But uh, in terms of 
looking in a serious way about where the typical American 17, 18 year old is, what he or she wants out of life, how to get from where he is or she is to there, is something that we've done really shockingly little work with. And the reason for that is because you know, institutions are basically lazy. And institutions that survive long enough always end up operating in their own interest rather than in the interest of the people they're supposed to serve. Uh, this is an old institutional problem. Uh, James Q. Wilson wrote a book about it called Bureaucracy, uh, worth your time. Uh, reading a book called Bureaucracy maybe is a little daunting sometimes. It's a great big thing, but it's, uh, it's worth it. Yeah, I think, uh, how to put it? We have a system that produced this thing, right? So when I was a kid, uh, there was a movie called Wall Street made by Oliver Stone. The character was a guy named Gordon Gekko. Uh, he was the great villain of Wall Street, and he had a cell phone. It was the size of a cinder block. Uh, it was made by Motorola. I actually looked this up. In, in modern dollars, that thing cost 10000 bucks, and it cost about $1,000 a month to operate. And you could not play Angry Birds on it or text or anything. It just you know, made cell phone calls. Um, we let the markets work on that. We let innovation work on that. We let people come up with all kinds of different ways to do things, and there are all sorts of different cell phones. Um, we let capital go to the places where it was actually going to work. We don't do that with education, and to some extent, we don't do that with some other important things like healthcare. And by trying to centrally manage these things through bureaucracies like this, through self-interested institutions, um, through things that are immune from normal market pressures that help capital to go where it's supposed to go, we almost ensure that we're going to have ineffective institutions related to those things. Um, I think probably it starts with the public school system, the K through 12 that we have right now should probably just be, I mean, it's not going to happen, but the ideal thing would be just to shut it down, burn the records, fire all the employees and start from scratch. That's what I would do. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, kind of going off what you just said, um, do you think that if you uh, remodeled the education system, do you think it should be kept public or private? Sure, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think it is important to distinguish between the government delivery of services and the government funding of services. Uh, these are very different things. So for instance, a lot of people don't like food stamps, but food stamps actually work pretty well. Um, it's a program that actually does more or less what it's supposed to do. Think about the alternative to that. If we ran food stamps the way we ran education, we would have government running farms and grocery stores and the distribution centers behind them. Uh, we would essentially have you know, one of these Soviet-style uh, agriculture and food distribution systems, which you can guarantee is not going to work very well, because we've seen them. I mean, go to Venezuela and look how well it works. Go to Cuba and look how well it works, or North Korea. Um, so while there are problems with the government funding of services that are not delivered by government, there will always be fraud and waste and abuse and this other stuff. By letting people make their own decisions and helping them financially to do that in cases where they need to be, I think you end up with a much more effective system which is probably a complicated way of saying vouchers, but, um, but certainly something more than that. Uh, you know, vouchers in the context of what we have right now, which is essentially a 85% monopoly public school system, a relatively small religious parochial school system, and an even smaller kind of elite private school system, a few charter schools and other things. I think you have to change the production apparatus before you worry about how you fund it too much. Uh, the funding is really pretty straightforward. And that's one of the heartbreaking things about where we are in the United States is that um, we have all these things that we want to do and we act like we don't have the money to do it. We have plenty of resources to educate all the kids who need to be educated. We have plenty of resources to take care of all the people who are in really dire poverty and need to be taken care of. This is not a problem that a society like ours faces. We're an extraordinarily wealthy society. What we just throw off in garbage and waste uh, would pay for half the modern American welfare state if it were being... Um, run in a way that was sensible and if it were being run in a way that was actually oriented toward uh, benefiting the people it's supposed to benefit. For instance, if you look at Medicare and, uh, or Medicaid rather, if you look at Medicaid uh, where the money actually gets spent, uh, tons and tons of it gets spent through uh, private contracting uh, of clinics and things that's not really quite clear to do anything. My favorite story on that, and again to go back to what do you do, uh, you know, Florida has a huge problem with Medicaid fraud. Some of you all probably know this, and Medicare fraud to an extent because it's an older population. So there was a clinic in Dade County near Miami that the federal government thought might be engaging in, in Medicare fraud. And so they studied it for a while, and they looked at it, and they decided they're going to raid the place, right? So they do the full-on, you know, 
Waco style pre-dawn raid, kick down the doors, go inside, and there's nothing in there. It's a post office box. Uh, it's a post office box that has billed the American government for more than a billion dollars in Medicare reimbursements. There's not even a hospital there as far as anyone can tell. And uh, this has happened all over the country. So uh, people who say they want to you know, balance the budget on getting rid of waste, fraud, and abuse and things like that are always lying. That's never actually how you do it. But there is a substantial room for uh, improving the way capital is, is moved around in those places. And even in places that aren't outright fraudulent. You know, I mean, go to any physician that does a lot of Medicare business and look at their books. Essentially, it's like a mafia, oper a mafia operation where they keep two sets of books, right? Here's the actual clinic budget. Here's what we're billing the government. Um, these are things that don't uh, serve the interests of the people they're supposed to serve. And that's really where the main problem is. It's not the people who, uh, the problem with the welfare state isn't the people who receive the checks. It's the people who write the checks. It's the people who administer these programs, who run the agencies, who run the bureaucracies, who end up inevitably being self-serving figures. It's just the way these things work. Did that answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? Yes, sir. So just to be clear, I'm not affiliated with the university. I'm not faculty or student or anything. So right. um, just didn't want to misrepresent myself here. So I'm cu totally curious, um, preface by saying I agree with most of the things you said, but I am curious what is your intent or what, it, what are you hoping to accomplish by this, by this approach to this lecture? Yeah, um, I think that solving problems begins by understanding them. And... Um, there are certain institutions in society that have a great deal of prestige attached to them. And prestige is a very powerful thing in a free society. Uh, it's really how we evaluate things, how we grade things. And um, there are a lot of institutions that have outlived their prestige. They're living on their reputation. It's not actually doing what they're supposed to do. Higher education has become so central to young Americans' expectations of what their lives are supposed to be, where they're supposed to go, what they're supposed to be doing, that um, it's the fundamental economic fact in a lot of people's lives. There are a lot of 22, 23 year old people who graduated from college having received neither skills for a job nor a liberal education, um, but who do have a tremendous amount of debt that certainly circumscribes what they can do in life. And that is an, an enormously uh, consequential thing in ways that aren't, I think, generally appreciated. A lot of important uh, ideas, entrepreneurship, uh, founding of companies is done by people who are really quite young, by people who are 25, 26 years old. And you can do a lot less of that if you have $100,000 in debt and you make $27,000 a year. And uh, your debt payments are uh, equal to your rent, probably, in some cases. Um, which is you know, one of those things that if you look at um, you know, the history of the technology industry and the people who were the big innovators there, Bill Gates, Mark Andrees and some of these people, they came from moneyed families uh, because a lot of them were able to take five or six or seven years to try to run a business, to start something, because they weren't under dire financial pressure just to pay the rent and do those things. And uh, I think we're cutting off a lot of people from being able to take chances. You know, my first job, I was paid $500 a month. Uh, this was, was in India. And that's not a lot of money. Even back then, it wasn't a lot of money. Uh, but I was able to do that because I didn't have any student loans. If I had had, if I'd gone to Yale instead of going to the University of Texas and I graduated hundred thousand dollars in debt, yeah, my life would have looked very different. I think I probably would have gone to work, you know, for Bear Stearns, and I'd have really been screwed. Yes, sir. Um, so, if if much of this has to do with market, let's say market conditions, mm -hmm. that your your solutions and so forth, you'd think that education would move due to market conditions, but there are cultural conditions in sure. place, right? So. <coughs> I know at Athens High School, kids snicker at, at some of their peers who are going to do vocational education or are going to go to Tri-County, I mean, somewhere nearby and do yeah. vocational education. I have had conversations with them and said, I have a PhD from UC Berkeley. My electrician and my plumbers make much more money than I do, okay. yeah. right? So there are, there are cultural values in place that some would suggest make me somehow more productive in society or more dignified in some yeah. ways? No, no I, 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 sure, yeah, this is something I've actually written about quite a bit, and I think this is an enormously important point you're making. Uh, we treat people who work in jobs that don't require a college degree as losers. We do. Uh, it's a social thing. 
even though a lot of them make a lot more money, have happier lives than people who go to school, take on a lot of debt, go to work from nine to five every day and play with spreadsheets and uh, never make any money, never do anything fun. And, um, but they feel like they're somebody because they have a white collar job and they, and they went to college. And one of the great ironies of life is if you look at uh, reality television programming, right? These guys who make $45,000 a year working in an office go home and watch television shows about guys who build motorcycles for a living, uh, who do you know, actual work, you know, welding and whatnot to make a lot more money. I was just down in Midland, Texas. Uh, I'm writing a story about the uh, oil business down there. I talked to a guy who's a laborer uh, for one of the drilling outfits down there. I asked him what he did, and he said he mixed mud, which means he prepared fracking fluids to be shot into wells. And uh, there's a particular mix of you know sand and lubricants. It's actually something you have to learn how to do, but it's not something you take a four-year college degree to do. And I said, how much money do you make a year? And he said, well, I made $95,000 this year. I made $95,000. 19 years ago. Um, actually, here's a, a great story about that very thing. This guy wrote a story about a couple years ago called Joel Buckowitz. Joel's a very interesting guy. He owns a company called Cut Brooklyn. Joel makes kitchen knives. He makes the world's fanciest kitchen knives. They are $3,000 a piece, $4,000 for these kitchen knives. Chefs buy them and stuff. Joel and his wife both got MFAs in creative writing from, I want to say, NYU. And they're going to be novelists. And uh, the family had a farm down in Georgia. And they decided to take a year off go down to the farm, live on the farm for a year, work on their novels. Eventually decided writing is really hard work and it's kind of boring sometimes when you're off in a room by yourself and I don't think he was actually very good at it. And he, being on the farm, got it into his head one day, he's gonna try to make a knife. He found this tractor spring, it was kind of basically flat and long like that. And as he put it in the interview, I made a knife-shaped object. It wasn't very good, but he got interested in doing it. So after paying probably $200,000 in tuition over the years to get his master's degree from NYU, he goes to YouTube and looks at some videos on how to make knives and orders a couple of books off the internet and learns how to do it. And a couple of years later, he's got this wonderful, thriving business that has a little shop in Brooklyn. It's open for four hours a day, two days a week, sells his whole inventory uh, every time he goes through. I don't know how much money he makes. It seems like a lot. Um, but he thought, you know, I want to be a novelist. And the way to be a novelist is to get an MFA in creative writing, because we all know that's what Shakespeare did. But, um, to the broader point, I think, uh, there's a lot of good things that people can do that are work as traditionally understood, like labor. And we don't really teach people how to do that. In the oil business, for instance, there's a really big gap. So they've got the completely unskilled laborers who you know, show up and they haul stuff off in wheelbarrows and they move stuff around. They don't really have any particular skills. They get lots of those people. They have people who have master's degrees in engineering and geology who find out where the oil is and figure out how to drill for it. But they have this huge market in the middle for skilled labor that's not university trained labor. It's people who now have to do things like pipe fitting and certain kinds of technical welding. And they have a hell of a time finding people to fill these jobs. Uh, they go all over the country looking for people and they pay them tons of money. We're talking you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for some of these people. There are welders down there you know, who are making a quarter million dollars a year because they're good at this stuff. And uh, there are a lot of people in Southern Ohio and West Texas where I'm from and Eastern Kentucky and the South Bronx and other sorts of places that are not really economically vibrant right now who probably could be benefiting from this. But they don't know how, right? And we don't do anything to teach them. And uh, in fact, we discourage people from this because as you pointed out, we sort of sneer at the idea of vocational education and we also sneer at the jobs that are related to it. Although, weirdly enough, we also live in an era in which, there's, which the words celebrity butcher mean something, right? Like, there are famous butchers in Brooklyn. People pay lots of money to go take classes with them. They're butchers. You know, butcher is not a job that used to make you a celebrity. Uh, but people are interested in this kind of stuff. They're interested in craft. They're interested in people doing certain kinds of fine work. And you're right about the money, you know. I mean, I would imagine your average guy running an auto body repair shop in Lubbock, Texas, my hometown, probably makes more money than the average university professor does. I would think that's almost certainly the case, almost certainly the case. So we could start by, but cultural attitudes are hard to change, right? You can't pass a law that says don't sneer at people who work for a living. You know, uh, we can try to educate people. We can try to explain things to them. Uh, we can try to let them know that they're being useless snobs. Um, and also let them know they don't make very much money. You know, go ahead and sneer at the guy who welds for a living. He can buy and sell you three times over. You know, he's got a, uh, he's got a $40,000 boat and you've got $100,000 in student loans. I don't know, it looks like a pretty good trade to me.
Yes, sir. I want to ask, uh, considering that most of us might just be uh, seniors at this point, ready to graduate, what should be our like outlook moving forward if what you say is true and that um, for the most part, most of our education might be considered useless, yeah. what should we do uh, to try to better ourselves in this environment? Yeah. Um, so again, well, what do you want? You know, uh, I mean, there are people who really care about music, you know, all kinds of music. Classical music, in, in my case, I have a friend named Jay Norlinger, who's a great classical music critic. Um, learn about it. Go to concerts, talk to people, go to lectures, maybe take some classes if you, you care about that sort of thing. Uh, if there are particular job skills that you want to have, learn them, uh, whether that means taking a formal class or doing an apprenticeship or, or whatnot. I mean, the, the real problem we have isn't that we don't have the means to take people where they want to go, is that we don't really do very much to help them discern that. You know, I was very, very lucky in life that when I was about 13 years old, I figured out what I wanted to do. I was good at writing, and I uh, figured I was going to do that, and I think I published my first piece when I was 14, something like that. And um, I've pretty much been doing it ever since. I did work at Burger King and 7-Eleven and a few other places for, you know, money over the years as I needed it because it's hard to make a living as a writer. It's really hard to make a living as a 16-year-old writer, you know. Uh, so there are various things I did, but basically as a profession, that's all I've ever done. And so from a very young age, I could say, well, I need to, you know, work at my school newspaper. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to actually learn how grammar works and not have two errors in my uh, piece on my resume, even though I'm a PhD. Um, we don't do a lot of that for people who are at the age where we can really do it. One of the things we do goofy in education, I think, too, is we start higher education at the wrong point, right? Like, for people who are kind of smart and ambitious and know what they want to do in life, you don't really need to wait until they're 18. Uh, you could probably start a lot of that at 16. I don't know about a lot of you. I learned a lot more between the time I was 15 and 18 than I did between the time I was 18 and 20, I think. Um, for whatever reason, maybe it's my mind was more active at that point. Maybe it's the environment I was in. I don't know. But um, for a lot of people, I mean, not only is college a waste, but the last couple of years of high school often are a waste, too. But for the people for whom college is not going to be a waste, the last couple of years of high school very often are a waste. We should probably just push them on in to where they need to be. Um, which, again, this sort of one-size-fits-all factory model of education that we still cling to for whatever reason of social inertia or laziness or self-interest um, makes it very, very difficult to do that. So I think it begins by understanding, you know, what education is for, what we should be doing for people at these very formative years in their life, rather than saying, um, well, here's this magic thing you do. Go to college. It costs money. Get out of it. Get a job. Got another question? Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned, um, don't need to stand again. Really. If you would, it's easier if people hear you. OK, that's fine. So you mentioned like uh, electricians, plumbers that make a good amount of money. They work hard. They make good money. Some people we come out of college don't make as much. But someone like me, I come from a small farm town. My dad's a car, used car salesman. I have no connections, and I want to get in the sports play-by-play -play field. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how to do that. I didn't do any of it in high school. Didn't learn any of that until I got to, to college. How does someone like me like start with that while I'm young, while I'm 10, 11, 12 years old? And yeah. like I said, I had no idea what anything to do until I got to college. Yeah. Um, breaking into media jobs like that, you know, is a fairly difficult thing to do. Um, I have a good friend who works for ESPN. He has a law degree. I don't think he ever, you know, did anything in terms of background, in terms of talking about sports. He likes sports a lot. He's smart. He's articulate. Uh, he spent a lot of time doing political talk just because that helped him get on television and get in front of people, but he really wanted to do sports. So he does that now. Um, there are a couple of problems with what you're, what you're talking about and problems that I, I had similar ones, especially if you come from small towns. Uh, you come from places that don't have a lot of different kinds of business, a lot of cultural infrastructure. You know, if you're growing up in Lubbock, Texas, and you want to go into book publishing, say, well, not a hell of a lot of people to talk to. You know, not a lot of, you know, New York City book agents retiring to Lubbock, Texas to while out their uh, years. Um, the field you're talking about, though, is sort of like saying I want to be a rock star or an actor, right? I mean, you can study music, you can study acting, but actually breaking into something like that where you've got 10,000 people who want to take every opening there is is a very difficult thing to do. These endeavors are largely social. 
you know, getting into that kind of thing largely is based on relationships, knowing people, uh, that sort of thing. And there's not really a good way to abstract from that into education, right? Um, you can't say, hey, you should go find yourself some parents who know people in the broadcasting industry who can introduce you to friends. Uh, life is just, you know, sort of unfair that kind of way. Uh, are there opportunities that come to people through formal education programs like that? Sure, because you're talking about, you know, building institutions, building relationships, and that is one of the values that are created by things like journalism programs, I think, is that sometimes you do meet some useful and interesting people through them. So, yeah, not to pretend that they are zero value propositions. They certainly can be, can be good that way. I don't think that's the only way to have those, though. Do you? Uh, you know, these kinds of jobs probably should work on a kind of, you know, apprenticeship model where you go work with someone who does it, see if you can do it, try to do it. Um, you know, a lot of people who do, for instance, um, oh, I went to a high school football game a couple of nights ago. You know, the Midland, of course, you know, so it's Friday Night Lights. It's a stadium with 20,000 people in it. But I'm pretty sure the person doing play-by-play -play is not paid to do that. You know, it's someone who is uh, interested in doing it and likes high school football and, uh, and wants to do that kind of thing. It's like anything else. I mean, you, you do it by doing it. There's not a magical formula for getting into it or getting through it, I don't think. Yes. So you said that we need to reestablish all these body schools. Um, but what you haven't addressed is what you think, because you know children need to be educated. Mm. So what sorts of curriculum, what sorts of pedagogy do you think is important to a system in order to make it functioning so that students can thrive in a world where you don't necessarily think that higher education is the key? So what sort of information should be covered in order to prepare young children to succeed in the world? Yeah, again, I don't think there's, you know, a single answer for that, even for very young kids, um, because different kids have different interests and different abilities and different kinds of inclinations. Uh, you know, for the very early parts of education, you know, language, basic math, these things. Uh, things that we don't really teach anymore, like grammar. Uh, grammar is really very useful to people because it teaches them to look at language as a formal structure rather than as something they intuit and that they're used to. Uh, we don't do a lot of those kinds of basic things. You know, I think the old traditional seven liberal arts are not a bad uh, place to start uh, to teach people the basics of how to write a sentence, uh, the basics of how logic works, the basics of music. Uh, have them read some useful books. Uh, have them read some important books. That would be a huge start, I would think. Now, you maybe know a little bit more about this than I do. My general read on it is that you really start to see some real differentiation in kids in terms of their academic inclinations and abilities pretty undeniably around the age of maybe 10, uh, 10, 11, something like that, at which point maybe you take a more specialized approach. Uh, the problem with that you run into, we've had trouble with this before, um, is things like tracking, you know, where you're pushing kids into classes because it's easier to put them into less challenging classes uh, because, not because they're not smart, because maybe they're socially difficult, they're rambunctious, uh, that sort of thing. So better thinking doesn't necessarily solve dysfunctional institutions. Um, but I think it starts with asking the questions and looking at it. and sort of like the question about how we think about work, of trying to put this on people's intellectual agenda. So for instance, looking at the New York Times uh, for the last couple of months, and uh, they had 35 stories on the debate over affirmative action and admissions decisions at Harvard. Uh, the dropout rate for African-American students in New York City's public high schools is 50%. Uh, there's a school district called Hempstead on Long Island, which is about four miles from where the Times is printed, uh, in which something like 80% of the students failed to meet basic academic standards. Uh, two stories in the last 15 years on that. So we spend a lot of time thinking about things that maybe, it's not that they're not important, uh, but the kids whose inflection point in life is, I might get into Harvard, or otherwise I might just have to go to Berkeley, um, those kids are probably going to do okay in life. You know, if, well, my next best guess is Princeton. Okay, fine. You know, you're going to be okay in life. We don't think enough about people at the other end of the spectrum uh, simply because they don't have any political power, they don't have any economic power, they're socially insulated and isolated from the people who make policy decisions who dominate this kind of debate. So, you know, once every couple of years, someone will say, oh, look at the dropout rate in Philadelphia. What are we going to do about this? There'll be a blue ribbon commission. They'll produce a report and nothing changes. Um, 
that's really where the problem I think needs to start to be looked at. People who are being failed the most seriously uh, by these institutions. Because there's nothing wrong with the water in Philadelphia that says 80% of the students in the public schools there have to be underperforming academically. Whereas in Lower Marion, which is literally across the street, uh, has a college attendance rate of 95% or something like that. It's not money. Philly spends more money per student than most of the fancy suburban schools do. Um, it's institutional failure. And I think that's the thing that has to be originally addressed. In terms of developing specific kinds of curricula for early childhood education, I think I would probably leave that to someone with more expertise than, than I have to uh, work out the details of that. Never be afraid to say you don't know something when someone asks you, because if you don't know and you pretend like you do, you sound stupid. I'll take one more, then we'll finish up. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, so do you have any words of wisdom or advice for those of us who do want to be educators, for those of us who do want to help people learn? Anything yeah. to say to us to maybe help us along our journey to maybe bring about changes that can make things better? Yeah. Well, yes, I would offer you words of encouragement because it's very, very important work. Um, you know, I came from a... Uh, dirt poor family, only first generation to go to college, first generation finished high school. Uh, functionally illiterate? Close to that, probably parents. Um, and my life was very, very positively affected by encounters with some very, very good teachers. I was lucky to grow up in a college town because college towns tend to have better public schools than places that aren't because, especially if you're a place like Lubbock, Texas, it doesn't really have private schools. Uh, the people associated with the university put a lot of pressure uh, on the schools to be better. So we definitely need good people in there to do it. Um, I would say, you know, you're going to have to steal yourselves uh, because you're working in institutions that don't really care very much about the children and they don't really care very much about doing the job they're allegedly there to do. I mean, I look at things like the, you know, cheating scandal in Atlanta and uh, or the situation at basically every big city public school in the country. Uh, and a lot of the small rural schools, too. Um, it isn't lack of resources. You know, we spend two and a half times now per student on public education than what we spent in the 1980s. Uh, we're not getting two and a half times results, certainly. We're getting, you know, in many ways less. And um, these institutions don't want to change, right? Uh, they don't want disruption. Uh, people who are investment uh, people and venture capitalists say they're looking for disruption except for Peter Thiel, who always says he wants to invest in monopolies, which I think is probably more honest. But um, the public schools do not want to see their model challenged, because it's a good scam, right? Uh, you know, it's, um, I don't want to say this and sound too cynical, but I guess I feel like I sound cynical already. Um, if you put the compensation packages of the American public school system to a market test, what people would actually make in a competitive environment, and you take into full account uh, the value of things like, you know, health care benefits, pensions, and all that kind of stuff. We're probably overpaying people in those schools by about 75% would be my guess, something like that, maybe 50%. You don't really know. You'd have to know to, to run the test. The people who work there are not completely unaware of that fact. Um, when I was a student at the University of Texas, there was a big debate about disparities in faculty pay. So someone noticed that if you teach at the law school, you make a lot more money than you do if you teach art. And uh, they said, this isn't fair. And well, of course it's not fair, but you teach art. What's your next best job offer? Uh, the guy in the law school's next best job offer is being a lawyer, which is why we pay them more, right? Uh, this is how markets actually work. It's not uh, according to merit, because I don't think lawyers have any particular <laughs> inherent merit for the most part, but it's according to uh, supply and demand. And uh, we use the licensing system to uh, prevent people from entering into that market. Uh, we use the essentially monopolistic structure of the public schools to prevent competition. And um, people aren't going to want to change that. Um, just like people in universities aren't going to want to change tenure. You know, we have tenure because in the Middle Ages, the church would fire you for having bad ideas. Not so relevant in the United States in 2018. Uh, but we're still going to keep tenure. Why? People like it. They don't want to give it up. Um, it's hard to get institutions to change. It's hard to get people who have a great deal of personal investment in them to change. And uh, they usually don't change until they're forced to by some external factor. My best guess. Thank you all for coming out. I hope this was useful in some ways. I hope it's not too terribly depressing.
Uh, probably go ahead and finish your degrees because it'll make life easier. Uh, but try to have a clear-sighted understanding of what you've been doing for the last several years. Thank you all.